the FBI has a program called VCAP or the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. This program is responsible for the analysis of serial, violent, and sex crimes. It is designed to track information on violent crime, especially murder. One of their areas of focus are unidentified remains. The FBI has a database on their website where anyone can search for unidentified persons. They provide details about the death, as well as images of said persons and the belongings that were found with them. This program has helped families who have lost touch with the loved one get some closure. It has given a name to many Janes and John Doe's who met an unfortunate end. Unfortunately, there are still many unidentified people in this database. From my research, many of these people are transients, hitchhikers, homeless, and even undocumented immigrants. As a result, this makes it really hard for law enforcement to figure out who exactly these people were. Today, I will be talking about a well-known unidentified person. It is ironic that it is well-known in the unidentified community, yet no one has been able to identify who this person is exactly. On June 5, 1991, the body of an unidentified female was found at a Super 8 motel in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The staff at the motel were alerted that the person staying in room 233 had not checked out, even though they were supposed to have checked out the day before. As a result, they sent a security guard to check the room. After knocking a few times and getting no response, the security guard tried to open the door himself, but noticed that it had been locked from the inside. He managed to use a screwdriver to get inside and realized the door had also been locked using the deadbolt. At first, he didn't notice anything out of the ordinary, but once he made his way to the bathroom, he found a woman hanging from the shower. He called the police immediately. Once the police arrived, they began to search through her belongings and an autopsy was also completed. During the autopsy, it was concluded that the woman had used a suitcase strap to end her life on June 3rd, which is two days before her body was discovered. The body had already been badly decomposed, which was strange, since she had only died two days prior. This was later attributed to the fact that she had passed away in the shower, which could have been warm and humid. And of course, heat makes a body decompose much faster. Heroin was found in her system, but other than that, nothing out of the ordinary was found, and the cause of death was labeled as a All the evidence was consistent with Although some people like to speculate that there may have been some foul play involved in this case, there was no evidence to support that. There were no other points of entry in the room or windows that had been opened or tampered with, and it wouldn't have been possible to leave the room and use all the locks on the door from the inside. Law enforcement had also begun to go through the belongings she left at the motel. Amongst the things found were lots of alcohol bottles, her purse and pocketbook, which did not contain any IDs, $500 in cash, and her suitcase filled with clothing. The only two items found in the room that could be possible leads to figuring out her identity was a scale with the name George Martinez written on it, as well as a photo booth picture of her with an unidentified male. It is believed that this type of scale is commonly used to weigh drugs, and the fact that heroin was found in her system is good evidence that she was probably addicted to hard drugs and alcohol. Of course, many people at first connect the name George Martinez to the photo booth picture. When law enforcement showed the picture to the motel staff, they identified him as Eduardo Collin. He was the truck driver who had checked into the room on June 3, 1991, between the hours of 9.30 p.m. and 11 p.m. He rented the room for one night only, and the staff did not remember seeing anyone else with him when he first got the room. All of the information he gave at check-in was verified to be true. The only information that was fabricated was the license plate number he provided. This was a huge lead in the case, and it seemed like a great opportunity to identify who the woman was and what exactly happened in that motel room. Unfortunately, tracking him down was difficult. Neither Eduardo Collin or the name George Martinez were useful in identifying this Jane Doe. 
It wasn't until many years later that law enforcement were able to find some of Eduardo's relatives. But the things that they said only make this case more frustrating. Eduardo had passed away due to natural causes a few years back. So the one person who could give some answers is no longer alive. To make it even worse, when his family were shown the photo booth picture, they did not recognize the man in the photo. They claimed it was not Eduardo and that they did not know who the woman in the picture was. This led to a dead end, and the case remained cold for many years to come. It wasn't until March 2021 that an anonymous tip was received. The unidentified person might have been known as Becca. She may have been from Los Angeles, California, and she reportedly flew from California to Albuquerque. So who is mistaken here? The family or the motel staff? There are so many questions revolving around this case, and as the years have went by and more details have been uncovered, it just makes the case even more confusing. Some believe that there is some foul play involved in this case and that Eduardo Collins had more to do with Becca than we know. This would mean his family lied and possibly tried to cover up something he did. But my question with that is, why cover for something if he is already deceased? If Eduardo was the person in the photo booth picture, why did he leave Becca behind in that motel room? If they were in a relationship, would he not have found it strange that he didn't hear from her for two days after leaving the motel? It's strange that if this was the case, he didn't come forward to identify her. Her death was ruled as a suicide, so it's not like he would have gotten in trouble for anything had he come forward and given some identification for her. Also, why did she have all her belongings, including a suitcase filled with clothes with her? He also used his real name, so I don't think it's very likely he planned to do anything in the room. If anything did happen, it was probably in the spur of the moment. I don't really agree with this theory, but that is just my opinion. I just think the evidence is not consistent and the staff could have easily been mistaken. But I will admit, it is not impossible that they did know each other and that he was the man in the photo booth picture and that his family covered for him. I will also admit, it is suspicious that he didn't check out when he left. It kind of makes sense if he didn't want to call attention to himself. I'm not too sure, but I think you usually get charged for another night if you don't check out on time. So it's weird that he wasn't worried about that and just left without saying anything or returning the key. But then again, this was in 1991 and things might have been different then. The most popular theory is that Becca was the second girl. It's possible that Eduardo Collins hired her for the night and then left and had to get back on the road since he was a trucker. He could have left her the room for the night and had no idea that she was going to end her life. This would mean that she was in the room alone and would explain the locked door. The suitcase that she carried around with her clothing would suggest that she led a more transient life. The combination of not having a home, being a sex worker, and being addicted to alcohol and hard drugs like heroin can take a toll on anyone's mental health. Some people speculate that the male in the photo booth picture is not Eduardo Collins, but maybe a boyfriend she had, or at least someone she cared for a lot, since she carried this picture with her and left it out in the open. It's possible that things might have ended with this person. He might have broken up with her, and this, plus all the other stuff she's going through, are motives for her wanting to end her life. It's not impossible that Eduardo is just a client of hers and is also the man in the picture, but it seems kind of strange to take a picture with a client. Personally, this is the theory that makes the most sense to me. It would explain why he never checked out. He probably let her have the room for the night and expected her to check out for him the next morning. No matter what theory you come up with, there's always inconsistencies, questions, and holes in the story. Now that Eduardo Collins has passed away and the name found on the scale, George Martinez, was such a common name in the area that it never led to any leads, there isn't really anyone else that can give answers except for her family or friends. Looking at different theories is good, but I think the most important thing for this case at this point is just identifying her and finally giving her a name. I would lie if I didn't say that this case didn't make me feel scared or creeped out. It feels rude to say because this was a person and this isn't some creepy pasta. This is something that actually happened to someone. There's a lot of interest in the photos, especially because they seem unsettling to some. 
The original picture has that bright flash and plus her expression. I can see why people are scared of it. It doesn't help that a copy of the picture was edited to show more of a neutral expression which just takes the picture from kind of creepy to uncanny valley territory. While I do agree that the pictures can be a bit unsettling, I think one of the main reasons it makes me uncomfortable is because I can relate to Becca. I came across this case for the first time during a period where my own mental health was at an all-time low and I was having some ideation at the time. And just as an FYI, this was years ago and I am very okay now, I'm happy to report. I had recently completed a lonely 16-hour drive from another state after a bad breakup and this case just resonated with me. Fortunately, I had a family and a home I could come back to, but that isn't the case for many people in the United States. I would be a hypocrite if I said I didn't regularly consume true crime media, but I think it is always important to remember to take a step back and realize that these are actual human lives we are speculating about. Becca was a person. She was someone's daughter, someone's sister, someone's niece, someone's granddaughter, and someone's friend. She was a human being and she deserves to have a name. I wish we knew more about her, but unfortunately, we probably won't know until someone comes forward. I hope that she is resting easy and I am so happy that there is a community of people out there working really hard to give her identity back. If you are going through some mental health struggles, homelessness, or addiction, please know that you are worthy of living. There are people here who care about you and love you. Don't be afraid to reach out to someone. There is no shame in asking for help. I hope you stay safe and take care.